Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the final session of the Climate Risk Summit hosted by the COP26 Universities Network. I am both your chair and I also one of the co curators of this session, Luke Kemp, I'm a research associate at the Center for the Study of Existential Risk at the University of Cambridge. This session is co curated by myself as well as Eric Mackey at Cambridge Zero. The session will be focusing upon cascading climate risks. Now, cascading risks are not defined by the IPCC. The rough definition we'll be working with today is events or trends that could potentially trigger or amplify other risks. This includes the transmission of risks both across borders, sectors, and systems. It's not just simply about the interaction of different risks, but it's also about how societies respond and how those responses could potentially be maladaptive. Now we have a stellar lineup today, including four panelists working at the forefront of different areas, including finance, food systems, conflict, as well as a kind of general study of societal tipping points. This session links quite acutely to the earlier session on tipping points. In many ways, and in talking in about societal tipping points, about how the responses and feedbacks to risks can actually trigger kind of tipping point in societies. Now, why focus upon cascading risks? I think there's two big reasons. The first is that they're relatively neglected. In comparison to the analysis of discrete impacts like heat, heat, heat waves, we know far less about risk cascades and they are far more difficult to study. And the second is, of course, because this is how risks occur in reality. We have to look no further than, of course, COVID-19 to understand that it's not just simply about the direct impacts of a hazard, but it's really about how society responds and about the cascade effects and knock-on effects that this can trigger. So to begin, we actually want to do something a bit more interactive and fun. So Studio 2, if you can activate the Slido poll. So all of you should hopefully see a link to a poll. The question on the poll is fairly simple. It is, in two words or less, which societal climate impacts and tipping points do you think might occur? So if you can use that link, follow it through, and then put in one to two words of the most likely impacts or societal tipping points that you're expecting, that'd be great. The purpose of this activity is to hopefully see roughly what the audience thinks could be lying in the future when it comes to starting points. Is it migration? Is it food insecurity? Is it conflict, nuclear war, or something entirely different? Hopefully this snapshot can then be compared later to what we actually hear during the course of the presentations. Excellent, so the results are starting to come through on the word cloud, which you should all be able to see. We'll give us a few minutes and as you'll see, the larger the cloud for the word, the more prominent and the more frequently it's been mentioned by the audience. Migration appears to be front and center, leading the race, followed by displacement, which is pretty closely connected. War has emerged. Now we're seeing some pretty clear trends already, both with conflict, which covers both conflict as well as war, as well as climate conflict, as well as migration, which obviously encompasses both migration and displacement. Then we have some more biophysical related ones like food insecurity, water insecurity, water scarcity, etc. Inequality appears to have entered the word cloud as well. I'll give it a few more minutes. <laughs> 
Okay, it seems like we've reached a, a rough steady state here. So to take note, everyone, it appears that from the audience responses here, the three big ones we really have are conflict, migration, and food forward slash water insecurity. Now, it would be interesting to reflect upon how often these actually crop up in the presentations from different panelists. So we'll call and enter this slide poll. Wonderful, thank you. We'll move into the presentations. Now, the first presenter for the day is Professor Ilona Otto. Ilona is a professor in societal impacts of climate change at the Vecna Center for Climate and Global Change at the University of Graz. She is also a principal investigator for a, unit, a uh, Horizon 2020 grant, which cannot be more aptly named. It is the Cascading Climate Risks Project. So Elena is perfectly and ideally placed to kick us off. She'll be covering a range of different areas, including the past examples of cascading climate risks, what the cascading risks are in general, as well as how we can look at COVID-19 as an example of cascading risks. So without further preamble, we'll hand it over to Elena. Yes, thank you. Um, it would be great if you could uh, put my slides on. Um, yeah, thank you for, um, for the invitation to talk. And exactly, I would like to take you through those kind of socioeconomic um, um, cascading risks and, uh, um, and, and possible, possibly also tipping points. Next slide. Um, yes, yeah, so, so first not to start with, like, what's the challenge? And I think it has to, we have to say clearly that uh, as long as we are talking uh, about those kind of level, lower levels of global warming, um, we can talk about adaptation, but if we go to those kind of higher levels of global warming, uh, probably uh, adaptation um, has its limits. So those two maps, they show uh, the differences in the temperature projections in summer months at the end of the century. The upper, man, the upper map shows um, the world that is um, on average about uh, or well below two degrees warmer than the pre-industrial level. And the bottom map uh, shows the temperature changes in the world that is on average um, beyond four degrees um, warmer than the pre-industrial level. Um, and you see the legend on the, on the right. So I think I don't need to explain ma ma much, but if you think about like uh, maintaining national uh, borders or national states and feeding uh, you know, 10 uh, billion people, uh, and you look at this bottom map, it's um, actually, uh, yeah, we, uh, I think it's not, not possible to, 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 to imagine how it could work. Okay, next slide. So uh, in the project that you mentioned, we actually look at those um, cascading climate uh, change risk and uh, what they actually mean for uh, different. Um, through uh, international trade, uh, stability and conflict, migration and uh, finance um, and business. Um, and those cases are actually already known. Um, so uh, there are those empirical uh, cases that show that those risks already are happening and cascade uh, into Europe uh, also specifically. And of course, I kind of uh, our general question is like, what can we do about it? What Europe, but also other regions, what can we do about it? Can, how can we adapt to those risks and how can we um, strengthen the overall uh, system um, resilience? Um, next slide. So here is like specifically one empirical example that uh, we investigated and we observed in the past, and it's the heat wave uh, in Russia that occurred in 2010, and also excessive rainfall and flooding in uh, Pakistan and parts of Asia that occurred uh, the same year. Um, and at that time, like those uh, cereal uh, production. Um, um, but also export ban that time in Russia led to um, um, very high food uh, price spikes on international uh, markets um, and actually uh, to food riots in especially in the in northern Africa that we know as the, as the Arab uh, Spring. So actually it, it has already like those uh, kind of climate, cascading climate risks um, can be already observed and well documented. But it wasn't only the, the northern um, 
Africa at that time, but it was also Europe. So, for instance, there is evidence that uh, through those increased uh, prices of uh, um, cereals, but also through panic buying, uh, uh, kind of, you know, also what we kind of recently also learned, um, um, some uh, products uh, uh, became very expensive and um, it actually led to food affordability problems. Like, for instance, taking the example of the UK, um, um, that year, uh, the number of people who um, who relied on food banks actually increased by 50 percent. So actually, those risks they already uh, cascade and and they are known. Yeah. Uh, next slide. Um, and exactly, and like a very practical example, or sort of maybe even natural experiment that we are experiencing uh, recently, it's uh, the Corona-19 um, um, crisis uh, or the COVID-19 crisis. Sorry. Um, and so actually this this is like something what we uh, try to learn from and um, also look at different policy responses um, and also um, something what we try to kind of uh, think about. So how to you know, adapt to such uh, risks in the future because they will be um, uh, more frequent. And next slide. And now about the uh, kind of what can we do about it? So actually to avoid those uh, higher levels of the global warming, we um, also need those kind of uh, rapid and um, non-linear system uh, responses. So on this figure, uh, we see um, the, um, the kind of the historical levels, uh, um, rate, the historical data kind of on the rate of change of carbon emissions in the history. Um, and also the future projections. So the red curve is showing this kind of four degrees scenario at the end of the century, and the purple uh, curve is uh, showing this uh, Paris compatible um, um, scenario. Um, so to kind of stay within those kind of lower, uh, kind of manageable lower levels of global warming, we have to halve global emissions by uh, 2030 and um, cut uh, emissions to zero net by 2050. And this corresponds to emission reduction rate of uh, 7% um, um, and more per year. So and next slide. Um, so actually uh, this is uh, something what we observed during the Corona crisis. And one once more, please. <laughs> Sorry, thanks. One once more, yeah. Uh, that actually uh, the, this, this rate of reduction uh, in the emissions uh, was observed that time during the Corona crisis. But unfortunately now the emissions uh, kind of um, 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 start increasing again, um, but but you know it's, I think it's like we uh, it's something what helps us to imagine you know like what actually what does it mean and what what, what the scale of changes that are needed to uh, uh, to to reduce uh, the emissions at this at the speed that is um, needed. Um, um, maybe also kind of like the question is also how to get there without this kind of massive uh, human suffering. So we know from the historical examples and also from the Corona crisis that we can decrease emissions when we actually kind of stop uh, uh, or, or uh, kind of um, seriously limit uh, mobility and, um, 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 and and kind of human uh, well-being. But the question is on how can we get there like kind of in a positive way um, and, and decarbonize um, the global society under at the rate that is required. And next slide. And this is actually the last slide that I wanted to show. So this is also the research that uh, I do in my groups with my colleagues, uh, where I actually ask so in which sort of areas of the social economic um, system uh, rapid change can be observed. Yeah, and one of such areas is for instance the divestment movement. Yeah, so this is like uh, or the financial markets in general. Yeah, so these are the areas where uh, there are documented examples that actually this kind of very uh, rapid rate of social change that is needed. So at the scale of like seven percent and more per year that we can observe there, like that there are those empirical examples that show that this is possible. And these are those areas. I, I will stop here. I think we can maybe explore some of it in the discussion. Uh, but uh, so to say, uh, there are those cascading risks that there are, but there is also hope, um, yeah, that there we have agency and um, uh, we can um, still do something about it. Thanks. Excellent, thank you, Lola. That was a wonderful presentation to kick off with. What I really enjoyed was this idea that these are not simply risks that we are going to experience in the future, but we already have experienced cascading climate risks. I was really I like this idea that social tipping points aren't just simply for risks, but also potentially opportunities for things like rapid decarbonisation. Next up, we have Daniel Quiggin. Dr. Daniel Quiggin is a senior research fellow with Chatham House at the Society of Environment Program. 
And there's also a recent author, a, a very relevant one, which is a climate change risk assessment, which includes an assessment of cascading climate risks. Daniel, I'll hand over to you. He'll be covering a range of different things, including the findings from this report, and I believe a deep dive into a number of different cascading risks that were identified. Here. Thanks, Luke. Thanks very much for having me today. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to start without slides and I'll sort of give a indication as to when the slides start. So, yeah, my name is Dr. Daniel Quiggan. I'm a senior research fellow here at Chatham House. Um, I suppose the first thing to say is that cascading risks are incredibly difficult to quantify, um, perhaps nearly impossible to quantify um, in terms of their probability, their frequency and indeed the severity of their impacts. There are just so many variables at play that climate impact models are perhaps not sufficient to explore and characterise cascading risks. So what we did and what many other people have done as well is to use an expert elicitation process in order to gather up people's uh, ideas, their opinions, and try and uh, move towards more of a narrative based approach to describing what those cascades may or may not look like. And I think it's important to say that climate impact models, which may be a better for direct impacts, can be complemented by these sorts of exercises. And that's exactly what we've done in this FCDO funded uh, project where we released a report uh, just last week or the week before. Time flies very quickly these days um, and the report's been really well received um, and it contained an assessment of both those direct, indirect and cascading uh, impacts. Just let me linger for one moment on those direct impacts. So a direct impact would be maybe people being uh, displaced due to flooding. You know, you've got that sort of initial hazard and that direct impact. Even with those direct impacts, um, they're not always easy to quantify or define. And that's largely because thresholds of impacts at a local level are not necessarily well defined. So a 35 degree heat wave in one country might have devastating impacts, but really not have any impacts in another area. And so I think it's really important to emphasize that those direct impacts are going are likely to be the initial triggers of the cascades but uh, climate impact models themselves need to be improved through uh, more engagement with local experts, local stakeholders on, on the ground in order to define at what threshold of impact a given hazard is likely to translate into, into impacts. The examples of direct impacts from our report are numerous and I'm not going to go over the, all of them, but I just thought I'd highlight one. Um, one or two maybe, which is that by 2040, um, under our emissions scenario that we think is most likely to take place, which is not that dissimilar to uh, RCP 4.5, around 3.9 billion people are exposed to major heat waves every year. So that's by 2040. And even sooner in time, by the 2030s, around 400 million people are unable to work outside and sadly around 10 million deaths per year. So you can see that that's really quite extreme. And just to set that into some current context, in 2019, there were a lot of people who were unable to work due to uh, heat waves already. So we compared uh, the lost working hours in 2019 to the lost working hours due to COVID in 2020. And we find that around about 50% of the lost working hours due to COVID in 2020 have already been lost due to heat waves in 2019. So if people think that heat that COVID sorry has already caused a lot of job losses, then heat waves are already doing this and are likely to do so even more as we go forward. So turning then to the cascading risks of which could be initiated by a heat wave, we assessed six different categories. So we looked at national and international security economics and trade, migration pressures, food security, health crises and energy security. So if I could have the first slide, please, that would be great. Just pause one sec. Brilliant, thank you very much. So you can see on the left hand side here, we've got those initial hazards and in the red text, 
we've got some of those direct impacts that we think or well, we've assessed under the risk assessment are likely to be those triggers of cascading impacts. So if we click on to the next one, just move forward. Thank you. So the impacts that multiple arrows here and I should say this is a summary of those six categories that I, I provided before. So this is really high level and but it, it hopefully captures the, the complexity of all the different cascades that experts highlighted to us. So from a variety of hazards such as droughts, agricultural droughts, storms and cyclones, wildfires and the rest, experts were concerned that as came up in the, the word poll um, at the beginning, water security, crop failure, um, impacts to infrastructure are going to be the primary uh, consequences or impacts of concern. If we can then move forward another, another bit, please. Um, this is likely to lead to social unrest, health crises, unemployment and poverty, deaths, food crises, GDP losses and business disruption. One forward again, please. Um, and the rise of populism, migration, state failures, armed conflict, market destabilisation, protectionism. And then one final slide forward, please. And then at the end, across the different six categories of impacts, we then categorise these down into those bullets that you can see on the right hand side. I won't linger on this uh, any further. If we can just move forward uh, an entire slide. So this is an example of one of the six categories that we looked at. So this being national and international security. The darker colours indicate the uh, the areas that experts had most concern over. So you can see, for example, that heat waves and sea level rise were uh, more of a concern to uh, experts than, for instance, wildfires, wildfires or floods but everything uh, that is listed here was a concern in relation to national and international security as pertaining to cascading impacts. So if we could go one forward again please. The direct impacts stemming from these would be uh, drought, uh, loss, of, loss of ecosystems, crop yield reductions uh, and failures. One forward again please. I'm going to have to lean forward because this text is quite small on my screen, um, but this would then lead to uh, water security, collapse of agriculture, ecosystem failures and habitat loss and health crises and pandemics. And in a minute as we go forward, you'll start to see that the complexity starts to build and build, which is really the big problem within uh, cascading risks because it becomes very difficult to quantify. So you can start to see that the collapse of agriculture and the shifts in ecosystems and habitat loss start to increase the spread of zootic and uh, zootic diseases and pests, as well as combining with the loss of livelihoods as agriculture uh, uh, starts to collapse and yield uh, uh, yields start to re reduce. The loss of livelihoods then leads on to collapse of economies and a breakdown of governance and destabilization of political systems. Go on forward again, please. Um, and that initial loss of water security and collapse of agriculture also leads to a loss of food security, compounding back into loss of livelihoods. And people start turning more to fish, fishing and uh, marine uh, systems for food supplies, which puts additional pressure on uh, uh, fish stocks. And then as came up in the word doodle poll as well, we then start to see more displacement and migration of people, um, forced and unforced displacement. One forward again, please. And uh, nearing the end of this, cas this particular cascade, social instability and disorder, state failures, increased competition for resources, questioning the legitimacy of decision makers. And then the final element, please. Oh, seems to have shifted a little bit. OK, I can't quite see the end of that due to what I can see on my screen, but the, in essence, this leads then to uh, regional and international destabilisation and the increased probability of conflict. Um, you can stop sharing the slides now if that's all right, please. Um, I think the big thing that I'd like to end on and highlight is that in order to prevent the probability of these sorts of cascade cascades materialising in the short term in terms of the next decade or so, 
it's really, really critical that socioeconomic vulnerabilities within the most vulnerable countries are addressed really rapidly. And for instance, one of the big areas of concern uh, for us is the Sahel. Uh, without addressing those socioeconomic vulnerabilities, cascades are likely to be initiated and flow out of those regions, uh, destabilizing uh, the regions in which they exist, uh, but also uh, global markets um, and uh, particularly wealthy nations. So I think it's within the interests of not just the most vulnerable countries, but also uh, wealthier nations to ensure that those socioeconomic vulnerabilities are addressed uh, with earnest. And with that, I'll leave it and look forward to your questions at the end. Thanks very much. Thank you for the excellent presentation, Daniel. It's worth reflecting on how some of these insights actually linked to earlier ideas in different sessions throughout the day. So I believe in the risk attribution session, there was quite a lot of talk about not just focusing on hazards, but also vulnerabilities, something that Daniel emphasised quite a lot there. In the previous session on tipping points, we also had a mention of how while there'll be a decrease in the range of many species, many pests and diseases will actually increase in their range, which obviously factored into this cascade here. Now, just as one quick reminder, you can pose questions by you by the chat function, and we encourage you to do so. We gladly and warmly welcome any questions for the discussion. Next up, we have Professor Alad Jones. Alad is the director of the Global Sustainability Institute at Angli Ruskin University. And he is covering a range of different issues, including both insurance, conflict, and also food security. This will be drawing upon a range of different work Alad has been engaged with, including the very poorly named Chaos Map, as well as the outcomes of the UK-US Task Force on, U on Food Insecurity. So without further preamble, Alad, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Luke. Um, and uh, look forward to the discussions and um, what I'll do is I'll try and build on the couple of interventions that we've already had. Um, as Luke mentioned, this sort of touches on a, a lot of work we've done in the past uh, with uh, UK US Task Force on uh, looking at extreme weather impacts on food systems and some work we've done with the insurance uh, companies. And actually a lot of work we've done uh, in collaboration with Chatham House in particular uh, and the team there looking at some of the the ways food moves around the world and how these big physical impacts can impact on the social systems. So while we're getting better at understanding climate models and especially in the future, um, actually a big gap in knowledge is understanding today's social systems and how these food uh, and energy systems uh, th from climate interact with our social systems and our responses. So that's a really important thing that we're trying to uh, to build on and build better knowledge. We do that using a number of techniques. Uh, we, we do build uh, sort of models that can then help advise and try and quantify some of the, the impacts, uh, mostly agent-based models, uh, to try and put some behaviours in so you can get some interactions between different parties so you can start to understand some of those behaviours as well as systems dynamic modeling so you can get some of these big feedbacks uh, that happen in the system both in the social system and in the physical system um, but i think as uh, we've just heard from um, uh, daniel around uh, some of the work that he's been doing i think the most important thing that we've got uh, as a tool in, in understanding this is expert elicitation. So it's asking people, what do they think might happen? How would they respond as governments, as markets to some of these big impacts that we're already seeing? So we've used those expert elicitation um, interventions through the, the task force uh, and through things like the chaos map that uh, Luke just mentioned to develop scenarios of the future, to do some sort of wargaming uh, type interventions to try and come up with what these um, cascading risks could look like today. Um, so to touch on some of those, I mean, the things we've been trying to do, we've heard a lot about these future risks and how climate change obviously will increase uh, the, the amount of energy in our weather systems and increase the likelihood of some of these impacts. But we've already seen uh, over the last decade or so some really big impacts on food systems in particular. Um, what we're trying to do with that is build these models that take those physical triggers around climate change, uh, as Daniel's just outlined, looking at drought and flood, 
plus overlaying other uh, physical risks that come through biological risks in food systems uh, and other risks in agriculture and soil uh, and productivity uh, and put those on top of some of the social systems. So when you have a cascading risk, so when you have um, a major global climate risk that looks at uh, you know, major droughts in the US in some of these big bread baskets uh, or major floods in China, we also have significant amount of global food being produced if those happen at the same time uh, or if they happen within the same sort of season and you have a, a global physical shock to the food system. And it's quite easy to wipe out 10% of global food production in one year from a physical shock. How does that translate through global trade uh, into our food systems, into the food access? So when we ask people, what do they think will happen? And actually, as we saw uh, in around 2009, when we did see a big food um, impact, what governments tend to do is that they will react to try and protect their own markets. So they will put on uh, in place uh, changes to imports uh, and they will put in place export bans. Uh, if there is too many of those, then that just adds to the global um, impact on food trading. Uh, what happens also is that you have market responses. So the markets will respond by panic buying or hoarding or restricting access to particular products. Uh, you also get futures trading kicking in. Uh, and that impacts uh, hugely on prices uh, and whether that's prices for grains or for prices for final products. It's mostly through grains uh, and the immediate price that you, you get the biggest impact. And then the people who are most exposed to those prices are usually the poorer people in the world. Uh, most of our food systems in the UK have a lot of marketing value added onto it. So we're less exposed to that raw price. Um, but as soon as you get those sort of price increases, uh, then food access can become an issue in some countries and they, that food access can lead to conflict uh, and conflict on the ground can then spill over to other systems, whether they're systems of people, energy systems, uh, and in certain cases you get extreme responses. So you can get um, cascading from conflict into uh, destabilization of governments, destabilization of local um, communities and death. Uh, what we've tried to do to understand this conflict is map it. Uh, so this is where the chaos map has come in and what we've tried to do is just look at any reported death that has been linked to a conflict where that conflict has been linked explicitly to energy, food or water systems. Uh, there's not a huge amount of that because you have to show the actual explicit link through uh, in reports, but you can start to build the picture over the last decade or so um, of the number of people who've died either in protests or, or in direct conflict um, where those things have been linked. That then gives you an idea of, of which countries are exposed to these uh, types of uh, impact and how those conflicts can build and become much bigger issues. So, you know, that's kind of big system and that cascade from a physical shock to an individual losing their life. Um, that sort of mapping through the system is, is really important. Um, and you get lots of other things that then come into the, into the system that can make that worse. And Daniel's point out some of those feedbacks that can uh, feedback onto the system itself. Um, but then you also have things uh, like choke points and Chatham House has done a lot of work on, on these sort of physical choke points, which can also be disrupted by um, climate change, but it, it can also be disrupted by boats getting stuck in the Suez Canal, as we've seen recently. So where you've got these physical pieces of infrastructure which are exposed to climate change, but also exposed to the vagaries of moving stuff around the world, that can also exacerbate some of the problems. It can add to prices, it can add to access issues. So all those things uh, play out. What we need to then understand is beyond that sort of impact on the individual uh, who lives their life uh, or access to food or, or the prices, you know, what does that also do to economies and, and different sectors? And a lot of the work we've then done is to work with uh, the insurance companies. Uh, we did a report a few years ago for Lloyds of London on food system shocks to look at how all of these different sorts of cascading risks could impact on insurance products. 
Um, and there's an obvious direct impact on agriculture insurance, but actually that's a tiny market. Um, the biggest markets are through business interruption, uh, through director's liabilities, um, through other types of insurance product which are much more mainstream, where the risks are much bigger, but they're not indirectly linked straight to an underlying food system. I think this is, you know, when we started talking about uh, terrorism and political insurance, you can see where that links into the conflict. But we also, in that report, looked at sports events insurance. So where you do get conflicts in some countries where it leads to event cancellation, then there's a big exposure potentially there. So there's some really indirect impacts that you can see from these uh, sorts of impacts through to uh, one of the scenarios we looked at was India cricket being cancelled. So there's lots of things that need to come into our thinking about the social impacts and that cascade all the way through. Um, and this is where I think we need more evidence uh, and more discussion about uh, how governments will respond, how we can coordinate our response and our understanding of these systems. Uh, the recent UK's climate change risk assessment, uh, so the third of those which came out earlier this year, so I led on the international risks around conflict and finance in those chapters, looking at both sort of insurance risk, investment risk and conflict risk abroad, uh, but then how that would cascade down to UK risk, but it cascades down to risk in the global economy. Uh, and as we're so globalised, uh, as we've seen very clearly from COVID, it's really difficult for us to protect ourselves or isolate ourselves from uh, this cascading risk wherever it starts. I think it leave it there and look forward to further discussion. Excellent, thank you, Alan. It's worth briefly reflecting on the sheer range of techniques we've already heard. So Alan mentioned here complex systems dynamics modeling, the chaos map used large scale literature reviews of both media as well as academic literature. And I think both Ilona as well as Daniel mentioned using expert elicitation. So it seems like unfolding and unraveling risk cascades has a whole bunch of different techniques that can be applied. Now, the final issue that Alp mentioned was insurance, which gives us a very nice segue into talking about the financial system and financial crises. We are joined now by Ellen Quigley, a colleague of mine at the Center for Study of Existential Risk. She's a senior research associate there, and she's also an advisor to the chief financial officer at the University of Cambridge. Ellen will be talking to us particularly about financial risk cascades and financial crises. So without further ado, Ellen, over to you. Thanks so much, Luke. Um, it's lovely to be with you all today, and it's been absolutely fascinating to hear um, what the others have had to say thus far. Um, so I'll just try to build on what they've already told us. Um, one of the things that really strikes you having just heard what we've heard today is the enormous complexities and interconnectedness um, of all of the um, risks and hazards that um, climate change is um, it intersects with in some way um, and how that interacts with our treatment of the natural world, biodiversity, um, the COVID crisis, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and those are some very, un every, pretty much everyone has mentioned how unpredictable this is, how difficult to forecast. Um, but what might even make it more difficult is the interaction with the financial system. You do tend to see these wild swings coming out of things like a fairly modest decrease in demand for oil um, in the beginning of the of the COVID crisis um, resulted in absolute chaos in the financial markets and um, oil trading at uh, negative amounts uh, briefly um, due to storage issues and so on and so forth. So you, you can see how even the level of chaos that we've just discussed for the last um, however long um, can become even more chaotic when it um, kind of manifests itself in the financial system. And I think one of the things that we learned from the last uh, major financial crisis, um, 2007 to 2009, or however you want to count it, um, is the that we tend to underestimate the role that interconnectivity plays in um, financial systems and their performance um, under duress. And um, I think that is likely only to increase. And my research looks at the ways in which the financial system um, contributes probably disproportionately uh, to a lot of these risks um, and the ways in which it might be able to play a, a role in supporting other entities to help reduce some of these risks. So. I just want to dig into that for for a moment a little bit further because 
if, if you think about it, the, the one of the central problems with the way our financial system is currently set up is that it doesn't do a very good job of dealing with externalities. And um, externalities are, if you think about it, what are um, causing or contributing to a lot of the risks that have already been discussed today. Um, and the issue there is, you know, uh, countries around the world have every uh, wish probably to uh, address catastrophic climate change and other major sy systemic risks. But um, they have a coordination issue as well. And a lot of them have other interests to balance against. But even so, there's a lot more uh, genuine interest on the, on the part of uh, global governments to address climate change than there may be on the part of a given individual company. And that is a major issue because companies operate across global borders and um, are not <laughs> always constrained by the legal regimes of any given country. And indeed, um, with very large multinational corporations, you often end up with kind of a race to the bottom um, in a regulatory sense, um, such that it's very difficult to catch out um, co major contributions to externalities um, with the usual mechanisms. So, you know, if someone's polluting a river in your country, you can usually do something about it. But if you've got a company that can easily leave your whole country, if you um, regulate the pollution in a in a river, um, that becomes much more complicated and becomes um, uh, very difficult to address given the number of externalities that we're talking about. Um, so, so I tend to work with large uh, entities like pension funds, endowments, um, uh, charities with foundations, that sort of thing. And one of the most interesting tools that they can bring to the table is uh, kind of a framework you could call universal ownership theory, um, which is basically the idea that um, the usual approach of the financial industry to risk is to try to protect a given investment. So it could be the assets of a company or an investor's portfolio, um, as opposed to um, looking at the risks that that investment um, may pose to the world, how it might be contributing to risks. Um, so I'll just give one stylized example. Um, so if you're worried about the risk to your portfolio, you might prefer Exxon to increase the height of its ocean going rigs, which it's done, by the way, um, to account for sea level rise um, stemming from climate change. But if you're a, a universal owner and you have to worry about externalities, you might actually want Exxon to decrease its emissions and thereby uh, reduce the risk of a rising ocean levels uh, in, in any case. So it, it, it's it really does involve flipping things around because it, it takes in, into account this recognition that as an investor who owns a little bit of everything and is very large and long term, you can't stock pick your way out of these, these risks. You know, you could choose not to own um, Exxon and there are very good reasons perhaps to do that. Um, but um, that alone will not uh, protect your entire portfolio from the other effects that um, all the other speakers today have talked about. Um, so it, it, it kind of naturally makes you think about risk mitigation yourself. So instead of the, 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 the increase in the height of um, Exxon's uh, ocean going rigs, uh, you are more focused than on actually mitigating these risks in the real world. And there are a number of different techniques um, that investors can use to, to um, enforce kind of common risk mitigation standards across the um, economy. Um, but and we don't have time to get into those today. Um, but there's real potential there because if you think about it, um, you know, something like um, climate, biodiversity loss, um, pandemic risk, we've already talked a lot about um, inequality. I'm really pleased to hear how much that's come up during this um, this panel as well. Um, that actually has a macroeconomic drag, um, you know, across the system um, it, with, with increased inequality because uh, people on the lower end of the income scale tend to have a higher propensity to consume, which kind of supports the overall um, economy. So. Um, what, what becomes very clear from working in the space with large investors like that who are uh, so long term and, and um, diversified is this need um, to, to stop thinking about risk to the portfolio and adopt more of the mindset that we've heard from the other speakers on this panel, um, which is to look at these sophisticated um, intersections among between and among risks and try to actually uh, look at the the externalities that are causing them in the first place, not necessarily predicting all of the results from 
externalities out of control, but looking at what we do know, um, which tends to be, um, you know, estimations around how much uh, something is likely to um, to contribute to uh, a problem, not necessarily, um, you know, all of the chain of um, potential results and intersections that could come from that. But I mean, we all know that it's, uh, um, it, it causes serious problems to exacerbate inequality and climate change and so on and so forth. And we pretty much know what is contributing to that at the uh, company level. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there for now, but um, uh, thanks to all of the other panelists and the organizers for this. And I'm looking forward to hearing um, the questions from the audience. Excellent, thank you, Owen. There's a really nice pivot there away from just thinking about risk cascades, but also thinking about their mitigation and I really like this idea that thinking about risk cascades and taking them seriously can substantially change how you do risk management, even for a kind of large institutional investor. It's also interesting to note that while financial crises and finance risk didn't occur very large in our word cloud, it obviously has popped up a number of times across different panel presentations. Now we're gonna move into the questions and answers. As another last reminder, feel free to use the chat function to pose any questions you have to the panel. Now, I'm going to use my prerogative as chair and put forward a question, which is, can we and should we try to quantify either the severity or probability of different risk cascades? Now, I ask this obviously both because Daniel kind of mentioned it, that there's a real difficulty in doing so given the complexity and uncertainty of these risk cascades but also because many of my colleagues have an absolute fascination of putting numbers on things. So I'm wondering, just to restate that again, should we and can we put a number on the severity or probability of different risk cascades? I'm happy to have a first stab. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, should we? Um, of course, if you, if you can, then you should always try and quantify something. Can, can we, I think, is the important uh, question to which I'm not sure that it that it is possible. There are just too many variables. I remember studying physics at university and as soon as you've got a three body problem, it becomes a nearly unresolvable uh, system to uh, determine what it will be doing in the future. And I think the point with cascading impacts or cascading risks is there's just far too many variables to to model with any degree of certainty. And I think the other important part here is that direct impacts or direct risks are so severe in of themselves and much easier to quantify. So for instance, you know, you're sort of 3.9 billion people experiencing major heat waves by 2040. In terms of like a quantifiable number, that is huge under a kind of fairly middle of the road emissions pathway I'm not sure what additional uh, value trying to quantify these really difficult things to quantify actually brings, given your error bounds would be so large. Great, thanks Daniel, that's very useful. Moving on, we have, I think, a response from Ellen, followed by Alona, and then finishing up with Alan. So I think I share Luke's implied skepticism um, about quantification. Um, not least because we, when these quantifications have been done in the past, they have tended to underestimate the issue, which almost does the opposite of what people intend. But the other, perhaps even more serious issue, I think, is that whole fields have gotten caught up in quantification as opposed to focusing more on mitigation. And my field is probably the worst for this. Um, in sustainable finance, there has been this disproportionate influence um, or uh, focus on disclosure and quantification, data quality, and so on and so forth. And we've lost a couple of decades to that. Um, it, it It's to the point now that the asks of major investors to companies tend to be disclosure-based only. And if you look at the evidence behind um, the link between disclosure and actual outcomes, you know, improvements in uh, emissions profiles and so on and so forth, there just really isn't a link. Um, so I think that getting caught up in the quantification game um, cannot can um, prevent you from getting the numbers that you need to truly act anyway. And to Alad's point earlier, I mean, the insurance industry might be able to do some of these calculations and for the very long term, but then their policies are annual. Um, so they don't, you know, they'll still find a way of making money and may not use their blo giant blocks of ownership capital to actually um, prevent the risks that they're seeing. Um, so I'm not sure I see 
that much utility in it relative to other efforts that can be taken to um, to actually mitigate um, the risks that we can clearly see, even if we don't know the exact magnitude of them. Elena? Yes, thank you. So I, I fully agree what has been just said and exact quantification is uh, difficult, sometimes uh, not possible or maybe even uh, misleading. But the approach that we try to use with uh, my colleagues recently is to look at thresholds. Yes, so sort of like to think in terms, OK, what was the threshold that somehow not the, the, the system or sub system can somehow cope with? And what's the, the threshold that uh, the system cannot um, anymore cope with? And, and those risks can start to cascade to other um, systems. Yeah? And an example would be like to think about the number of uh, uh, people that can be hospitalized in in, um, in 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 hospitals, yeah, in comparison with the, the whole population number, yes. Yeah? So so you know, okay, so this is uh, this is something what we can manage, and okay, if this number goes above this, then uh, there is a risk that you know, this will cascade into other serious problems. So maybe sort of like um, to to kind of sum up, yeah, maybe quantification is difficult, but sometimes it's useful, and maybe kind of thinking more in terms of threshold uh, is more useful than you know trying to uh, estimate the, the the exact numbers thanks and out yeah thanks i mean i think um generally i agree with everything that everyone said so far i i i'll probably go maybe a bit further and say i think quantification is impossible um because of all the multi-layered uh, aspects of it. So, I mean, if you, you can put a, a range of probabilities on a physical climate risk around, uh, you know, extreme drought wiping out X percent of food in the US. Then you've got to try and work out whether that will cause terrorism in Argentina. Um, and there's so many different points through which you have to layer probability on top of probability. So I'd, I'd say it's, it's actually impossible to quantify. However, if you're pricing an insurance product, you need to quantify it. So what we need to be careful is when we do quantify it and we will quantify these risks is that we understand the uncertainty in that quantification and that we don't end up with bankrupting the entire insurance sector or um, losing all our investments because we haven't really understand the, the full range of risk exposure. So I think it's, um, yeah, it's impossible to do, but we have to do it. And we, we need to do it as best as we possibly can but understand that once we've done it, that's not the end of the story. And we, and we need to bring in some of these qualitative um, tools that we have to, to better understand where it's appropriate to do it for a very specific reason, like price on an insurance product or reporting a particular risk in an investment or, or something like that. But when, you, when you're a government trying to decide how this cascading risk might impact future strategies, we should definitely not be putting in a cost benefit calculation and then deciding a policy based on that. It is impossible to do, but sometimes we have to do it. I think there's a very nice note to end on. Actually, I think, Daniel, you have one last thing to add to this. Yeah, I, th I think what Ali just said is incredibly important. I think th there's a bigger and bigger move, obviously, within the pension industry, um, within banks to quantify these risks more and more and more. But I think there's a degree to which if you if you quantify a risk in a way, what you're saying to that community is that by quantifying it, it can be avoided or it can be adapted to. And I think it's really important to emphasize that some of these direct impacts, let alone the cascading impacts, go beyond what countries can adapt to. And very soon are going to be locked in. So really, we need to accept that mitigation needs to be front and center of what we do. Um, and be aware of the fact that the more that we quantify and the more that we put into disclosures and balance sheets, etc., whilst it does provide a utility, it maybe sends the wrong message that these risks can somehow be avoided by adaptation, which I simply don't believe is true. Yeah, that's a very interesting point. I'm just going to give Ellen one last comment before we move on to the next question. Thanks, I can't help myself. Um, I mean, I, I agree with what you've just said, Daniel, but also feel compelled to remind everyone that the work that's been done to quantify risks in the financial sector has been about quantifying the risks to people's portfolios uh, or investments. 
not the risks going outward from the investments. Um, you know, so yeah, and and that that creates such a dramatically different picture that we're kind of talking about two different things. So um, just wanted to kind of put that out there as you know, they they might be getting good at one form of risk mitigation, but it's actually not the kind we've been talking about in the rest of the panel. A reminder here of Marty Weissman's work on the kind of tail risks of climate change and that some impacts may be some bad, so bad that they approach infinity in terms of their costs and might be a little bit difficult to put a number on that. OK, so the next question we have is from my colleague Eric Mackey, which is we talk about early warning signals for physical climate tipping points. Is it possible to identify such early warning signals when it comes to social tipping points or to risk cascades? So who would like to kick us off? Al, do you have the floor? Thanks, Luke. So um, I think this is where a lot of the research is now starting to focus and it, it's emerging and that there's more research funding going into this and governments are trying to understand that um, you can look at what makes something less resilient. So what makes a particular community less resilient to a particular shock? And this is where you can look for early warning signals, but it's not even really the early warning signals. It's, it's that underlying resilience of a particular system or society or community. Uh, and, you, and you can sometimes quantify those a little bit, um, but you can certainly look at, I mean, what you can't say is this village in this country will be impacted by this particular event that's happened elsewhere. What you can say is this sort of village and, and these sorts of places will have this probability of this type of event happening. So, um, so it is possible to start to add some of that um, information into some of the models and some of our understanding, but it, I mean, it's, it's more difficult to do and you have to understand governance, you have to understand where instability in systems come from, you have to understand how people respond and how systems respond, but that sort of data is now being gathered. Thanks, Alan. Hello, over to you. Yes, thank you. So, um, uh, yes, so I think there are attempts, uh, but of course it's, it's kind of conceptually difficult and also in terms of data it's difficult, but, but there are attempts also to kind of look at system control parameters and intervention points. So this is happening. Uh, well, maybe one example of something what actually takes place is that I kind of, it's, it's very simple, but to look first at climate change impacts and regions that are already um, quite you know, instable or kind of relevant to um, um, to to a kind of like there was kind of notes in the in the global important notes in the global system, and for instance, I know that uh, Red Cross is experiencing with such uh, measures here that they actually issue cash payments um, to, uh, to 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 vulnerable population actually before climate disaster happens. Yeah? So there, are, if, if if you know there there is um, some 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 climate extreme events approaching. So in a way, you know, you, you give people uh, cash payments before and you give them a chance to um, to adapt or to evacuate or to you know, buy food. And, you know, OK, if they can handle this, then the, those risks will not cascade to, to, to other um, sectors or, 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 or areas. So, so there are such attempts and I think it's uh, definitely worth to explore. Great, thanks, Lona. Over to you, Ellen. Um, Yes, I, I mean, agree with what the others have said. Um, just to add, I think if I were to pick one leading indicator of social unrest, it would be level of inequality, both intra-country and inter-country. Um, one of the scariest things I read was a report put out in January 2020 um, at a centre at Cambridge, I'm forgetting the name of, um, that looked at the link between inequality and trust in democracy. And there was a very clear um, correlation using this enormous global data set um, that uh, suggests that um, inequality is a, a major cause of uh, a lot of what we've actually seen in the real world in the last um, few years in particular with um, authoritarian governments and um, so on and so forth and frustration with democracy. Um, and that was before COVID took hold. And seeing the level of inequality that has just risen incredibly quickly um, in so many countries as a result of the pandemic, I think that's that's very worrisome, given what we already know about the link between inequality and a whole bunch of other indicators that um, go in the wrong direction. We have a quick response from Ilona. 
Yes, so so thanks, um, and it's actually really good point that actually we also learned uh, from analyzing data from uh, the COVID-19 impact. So actually that's the point that uh, it seems that countries that uh, suffer high levels of economic inequality, they also suffered more um, uh, deaths and and. Uh, um, and then kind of handle um, Corona wars. Yes, so actually this is a very important lesson that maybe you know inequality is sort of like an indicator that points out like a kind of a low system um, resilience yeah, to like whatever type of risks. Um, thank you. This is a very fascinating point. It actually reminds me of a historian colleague of mine, John Howland, who studies the Byzantine Empire and a number of others, and he points to inequality being the, the key factor that undermines the resilience of societies in the past to climatic change. We'll move on to the next question, which is, given all of the interrelated, highly dynamic interactions across sectors, where should policymakers in government begin if they want to retool their climate governance frameworks? So I guess in short, this is, Given how complex the situation is, how do policymakers even begin to approach addressing cascading climate risks? Who would like to start off? Okay, Ellen, you have the floor. Uh, just because I, it's a tough question and I don't have a full answer to it, but thought I would take the first stab and others can, can do a better job later. There are certain things we already know how to do and where the pricing is already good, and I think if if I were advising a government, that's what I would say to do, deal with the utility sector first, because um, it's the most readily decarbonizable and do that way ahead of anyone's schedule so that it frees up a bit more space and time to deal with some of the gnarlier problems that we face. Um, so I think, yeah, it's just act very, very quickly on the things we already know how to do and that can be done cheaply and then uh, expand from there. Um, simplistic answer, but the others can hopefully later on. Great, thanks for that. We have Aud followed by Ilona and then finishing up with Dan. Thanks, and um, so I agree with that. I think one of the first things they should do is try and understand the risk and, and how the risks cascade through the system. So it's it's really important to um, you know assess where these risks come from, how the system is linked together, and also then come up with something, yeah, you know, whether it's a food risk strategy, uh, so we don't really have that in the UK, or whether it's an energy risk strategy. Um, so it really is actually, what do we do in, in the event of some of these things happening? Um, I mean, I, I noticed there's, there's another question uh, that's been submitted around what governments can do to mitigate the risk of social disorder. And I think I'd link it back to the responses that others gave earlier around inequality. The best thing governments can do around the world is to tackle inequality first and foremost, to bring that down, to be transparent and not to be corrupt, um, so that people actually trust governments to respond and hold their interests in play. Um, and I will be accused of being left wing and, and too radical as, as that as a response, but you know, it, it, it really is that people have to be able to trust their governments, especially when we're seeing these cascading risks coming forward. So the more transparent they are, the more equal they can make society, um, the better our overall resilience will be. Alan showing his political stripes. Moving over to Ilona and then finish up with Daniel. Yeah, I'd say, you know, um, decarbonize as soon as possible and act now. So kind of to repeat the uh, the, the Fridays for Future um, slogans. Yeah? And uh, it's, it's, it's uh, well, where to start? I think infrastructure, as would said, you know, buildings, uh, renewable energy production, and kind of more courage. I think uh, we have to really talk about bans and restrictions and yeah? not only kind of price interventions and taxes because they are too slow. They are kind of they are kind of incremental tools. You know, they are needed, but they will not bring this kind of abrupt um, um, change yeah, that is needed. So so really bans, restrictions. And actually, it's uh, in a way funny that those uh, kind of the companies like car companies like they, they self uh, um, they, they make those you know, announcements that they will um, not produce any more, like for instance, a combustion engine cars by you know, 2030 or something. And this is happening in the private sector and it actually kind of, uh, I know it's frustrating that, that governments are kind of so much behind us, yeah, what is actually happening uh, in, the, in the private sector. Um, and uh, yeah, and I think yeah, so mitigation and uh, and and rapid action, but also international co co cooperation is very important. So we saw so in this example that I uh, gave from uh, 
um, you know, on those cascading risk, risks in 2010, like one of the factor uh, that kind of um, released those uh, impact cascades was actually the export ban uh, in Russia. Yeah. So I think if, if countries think um, or governments you know, think in this kind of uh, you know, traditional way, okay, let's control what is happening within our borders. I think this will uh, cascade to, uh, to 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 other sectors and um, uh, areas, countries, and then back to you know the, um, the 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 initial areas. So I think really kind of more international cooperation and this kind of system thinking um, is needed. Excellent, thank you, Lena. Daniel. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think I think it's important to recognise that most climate cascades are going to be initiated by direct climate impacts um, and an impact can't be an impact unless a hazard is translated through a vulnerability. So I think the easiest thing that we can do or the governments can do is to address the vulnerabilities that are likely to translate direct hazards into direct impacts within the most vulnerable countries um, because they have the least adaptive capacity and it's from those initial uh, impacts that the cascades are likely to stem. Um, so I think the 100 billion climate finance pledge that hasn't yet been fulfilled is a really clear uh, starting point. I think we need to get to the point where the wealthiest nations are fulfilling that 100 billion pledge because that will help in increasing the adaptive capacity of the most vulnerable countries, which then hopefully prevent the initiation of the cascades in the first place, at least if those hazards are occurring in vulnerable countries. Just one other point, the, the one dynamic that came up time and time and time and time again within our expert elicitation process was the interaction between shifting populations due to whatever direct climate impact be that flood, heat wave, etc. Um, and shifting ecosystems leading to uh, new emerging infectious diseases. Um, so, you know, you can't control where an ecosystem moves to, but you can control if a direct hazard translates into the impact of people being displaced or migrating. So I think working again, as people have already said, on that social inequality, making sure that individuals have uh, diversification of their livelihoods and their incomes and you're reducing social inequality is going to uh, minimize the likelihood of migration and therefore the emergence of new infectious diseases. Um, so I think there's for me there's sort of two clear actions that governments can take. Thanks. So I had a number of things come up there, reducing vulnerabilities, cooperation, as well as just the actual approach of decarbonizing and reducing the drivers of climate impacts. So it sounds like a lot of this is simply kind of scaling up things that we already should be doing. Now we're going to have a brief pause and what I want to do is move on to another interactive element of this session, which is an online poll. So Studio 2 team, if you can activate the poll. Now this is a fairly simple multiple choice poll in which we're asking you the question, what critical systems are most likely to act as mediums for climate risk cascades? And we give you a number of different options there. These include both geopolitical systems, health, food, finance, or others, if you'd like to specify. So audience, we'll leave it to you to start filling in that poll. And while we're doing so, 100% already, we're going to move on to the next question. So the next question is posed by Nevin Foucault, which is what is presently the state of art modeling frameworks for cascading risks? Is it dynamic or data-driven empirical models or something else? And how is the interaction of elements of the natural or non-human systems and human dimensions represented? So in short, what's the current state of the art modeling when it comes to climate risk cascades? Any takers? Excellent. Al, you can give us. Um, yeah, so I mean, it, it's a mix. A, a lot of it is currently done through expert elicitation, and I think a number of us have talked about that, uh, just in terms of trying to qualitatively assess uh, how that risk um, translates into the system. But increasingly, uh, I mean, I suppose in terms of the state of art, the actual modelling, if that's if by that it means quantification, 
it's using things like agent based modeling where you can add in behaviors and you can start to put in some um, you know some sort of quantification around the behaviors of different sort of sectors so this could be you know market agents or government agents or individuals um, and how that then is used is really important because because the, there are huge uncertainties around um, you know how you model or how you quantify a particular behavior uh, but that's I suppose that's where the state of the art is and trying to understand exactly how um, how the understanding we have from how people have responded in the past actually translates into something quantifiable that we can then use in, in models like agent based models. Would anyone else like to jump in? Ellen, over to you. Um, I mean, I do think that models are useful, don't get me wrong, but I do just want to add one note of caution, which is that I think that uh, even with agent based modeling that tends to still um, model a form of human interaction that doesn't take into account kind of large movement, you know, social movements, for example, aren't easily um, captured even with agent based um, uh, modeling. So I, I think there are ways in which humans interact at a large scale, especially I think probably accelerated by um, uses of the internet now um, that make the not not just the, the cascades themselves, but also the kind of contributing elements um, quite difficult to, to pull together into model form. Excellent, many thanks. Over to you, Alana. Well, I think the problem is also how uh, or what kind of data are collected and how data is collected because no, even to run uh, agent base or uh, I don't know, network models, you need some data to calibrate the models. And if you have no data, then it's difficult to uh, to, to, to produce such models. And the problem with uh, the, you know, the data that we currently collect, it's uh, mostly what within kind of national uh, borders your administrative units yeah? and uh, and of course you now climate risks they don't take care of uh, national borders yet yeah? they um, so, so so i think we, we need also different uh, way of collecting data also making those data this data actually accessible um so so it's actually uh, it's, it's very difficult to get such uh, such data and also having kind of you know, like especially uh, or geolocalized data and um, I actually, I'm a social scientist by training, and this data is still very problematic and very difficult to get. Um, also, data from companies, uh, data also on um, kind of very, very wealthy persons. Yes, yeah? so uh, like very wealthy persons, they kind of don't exist in the in the official statistics. Yes, yeah? so and like the same like very poor as well. So um, I think we need to uh, improve as well uh, to 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 be able to um, improve also um, the models. Thanks. They'll need better data to have better modeling. Daniel, anything to add to that? Uh, I th no, I, I think everyone has covered it. I, I don't disagree with anything that everyone has said. I, I, I think the only thing I'd emphasize is that the window of opportunity to actually ensure that the direct impacts that are going to initiate these cascades the window of opportunity to prevent lock in to those direct impacts is so small now that embarking on some complex modeling exercise, which um, the modeling community might take years and years and years and to achieve. I'm, I'm not sure what value that brings. I, th I think it's fairly clear we need to. We need to decarbonize as, as quickly as we can. And we need to address socioeconomic vulnerabilities through adaptation measures to prevent the cascades in the first place when hazards, climate hazards do occur. Um, yeah, the, the, the window of opportunity that we have is so narrow that I think most effort needs to be going into mitigation and adaptation, not long exercises in quantifying even more so the risks. It's time is short. That's a very somber and important note to end on. And of course, we shouldn't let the understanding of risks cloud the fact that we have very, very few, very little window of opportunity to actually avoid the worst impacts of climate change. Moving on to the next question, which is 
And this kind of touches upon something that Daniel rose previously in one of the other questions, which is what are the policies and actions that developing countries can take to address and reduce their social vulnerabilities to cascading risks? Now, obviously, as mentioned, Daniel already touched upon this, but I'm wondering if we can go into kind of high resolution answers to that. Daniel, you can kick us off. I'm just going to be really short because I don't want to kind of dominate the conversation, but um, I think the adaptation measures need to be driven by people that are locally on the ground, you know, parachuting in wealthy countries coming in and saying you should do X, Y and Z isn't going to work because they don't understand the local dynamics, they don't understand the local systems of governance, they don't understand local tensions, uh, societal tensions. Um, so they need to be driven by those on the ground. So, for instance, there was a report published a couple of years ago where 21 African countries had come together to identify that adaptation measures locally specific to them that needed to be financed. It's that sort of a, uh, a methodology that needs to be um, followed. I think the broad category of adaptation measures that are required, most of them pertain to the agricultural sector and diversification of, of livelihoods and incomes and addressing social inequality. And also any adaptation measure has to be implemented in a way that doesn't increase societal tensions and increase the probability of conflict, which has happened sometimes in the past. I'll leave it to others to expand. Would anyone else like to contribute, Ellen? Um, I just to re reiterate the the points that everyone has been making around inequality. I think that's probably uh, the easiest, uh, well, not not easy, um, but most straightforward um, uh, initial focus area. Not least because it would um, also uh, contribute to the government's ability to address things as they occur because of um, the kind of increased trust on the part of the, the populace and the power differential that can be in place when you have dramatic inequality in a country means that you're less likely to get um, a proper government government response that feels fair um, on, the, on the part of the population as a whole. Great, thanks Ellen. Hello, over to you. Well, uh, uh, again, no, I think inequality is crucial, and especially we think uh, that um, or we keep in mind that that actually many new um, um, millionaires and billionaires actually come from the global south. Yes, yeah? so uh, so it's not that those areas um, uh, are poor, but uh, they have actually higher inequalities. Um, so so this is something important, and maybe also kind of. Uh, um, um, there is this one paper showing that uh, conflicts are more likely to occur in uh, uh, racially fractionalized uh, countries. Yes, so, so in countries where you have many minorities, um, uh, so, so in such countries, like the, you know, if they are hit by, by climate change impacts, the conflicts are more likely. Um, so again, you not know, taking care of um, those um, inequalities and, um, and creating equal opportunities. Uh, for, for, for different groups of people, but of course it's easy to say so, and I think like uh, we need uh, solutions where uh, those regions uh, you know, are, are part of and, and it's kind of discussed and, um, and there's kind of like this participatory approach. And to finish up, Alan? Yeah, I mean, just to say, so I completely agree that the sources of conflict or, or the sources of that cascading risk having an I think I'm muted myself, sorry. Uh, it's really important to um, understand how that cascades through and then those countries, you know, working on those, reducing inequality, uh, thinking about their own governance, but also, especially from a climate justice perspective, you know, we have to recognise that the vast majority of the risk they're now facing going forward, while it adds on to already uh, underlying social tensions within those countries, the, the triggers are going to come from climate physical shocks and those climate physical shocks are predominantly caused by us in the West causing climate change. So one of the key things developing countries need to do is go to COP26 and not let off the hook the countries that cause the problem predominantly and say, look, we need you to not respond when these cascading risks are happening by protecting yourselves. You need to also respond by helping to protect us. 
So, you know, it's great if the UK can say, well, we'll just spend more money on food access uh, when there's a, a limit of food and we'll just let those countries, uh, you know, fight it out with really high increased prices then hope they don't cascade into risk. I think it, it's really important to say we also have to take the responsibility in not responding to these cascading risks by just isolating ourselves from the world because in the end we can't really isolate ourselves from the world and if these countries do destabilize at some point we'll be exposed to that. There appears to be a real silver lining here that the measures we can take to both address risk cascades and make more resilient systems also make more fair and just ones. Empowering local communities, reducing inequalities, these are things we should probably want, be wanting to do to build a better world anyway, regardless of risk cascades. We'll quickly move on back onto the poll. So, Studio, if you can show us the results of the poll, which I think have now more or less firmed up. And we have a hungry audience, and food has been the distinct winner, followed by finance, geopolitics, health. It's interesting that Food didn't play as large a role in the word cloud and finance didn't really factor in at all, and yet both of them have now become kind of key mediums for the transmission of risk cascades, which may potentially show some impact from our presentations today. Any reflections on that, panelists? Okay, we have Daniel followed by Elona. But, and I, th I think the, the poll is broadly correct. Um, I wouldn't sort of disagree with it, really. I, d I think food insecurity is the biggest transmitter, right? Like, I'm sort of surprised that the category of like displacement and migration of people wasn't there for people to vote on. But food insecurity is going to be the, well, not the, the only, but one of the big drivers of migration and displacement of people in the first place. So you could sort of argue that it's, yeah. Um, yeah, and I think I think infrastructure and energy maybe should have been in there and, you know, maybe was kind of covered by other. But, you know, we, we, we've seen cascading uh, impacts, maybe not necessarily driven by uh, a climate trigger um, in Europe at the moment through our energy system. And we've seen what kind of chaos and crises that creates. So I think infrastructure and energy systems is, is an important one as well. Excellent. So the poll's been fairly accurate, and I think that's further evidence of the success of a little bit of democracy. Elona, over to you. Well, I agree food is important, but I think uh, health uh, is probably underestimated. So actually, uh, uh, I think the health sector is kind of like the area where you, ha where you have the least uh, research or also modern results and most difficult to um, um, to, to, to understand, uh, and I think that yeah, the, the, the Corona crisis uh, showed us that actually health is uh, something really basic, and uh, it can uh, cascade to cascade to all uh, other sectors, yeah, and geographical areas. So I think um, yeah, I, I think that, that the health impacts uh, were probably underestimated in in the survey. Mm -hmm. So potential underestimation of health impacts. Uh... Ellen or Al, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I just wisdom of the crowd. <laughs> uh, it, it it's I, I, I do it, it's interesting if you ask uh, someone who has not heard from the other panelists today and and, and others who work in this area. Um, food doesn't tend to get mentioned that much. Neither does um, soil, crop disease. A lot of the things I was so delighted to see. Um, in the in the talks from from my colleagues on this this panel, and um, I think as soon as people do understand that food naturally rises to to the top, um, especially as a contributor to to migration, which was quite rightly identified by the audience earlier as being a major risk. Excellent, thanks, Ellen. So we have exactly five minutes left, which I think gives us a perfect time slot to potentially have some concluding thoughts from everyone. So. Does everyone have, say, 30 seconds to a minute to distill one last pearl of wisdom or concluding thought at the end of this panel? Howard, since you didn't speak for the previous one, I'm going to get you to start. Thanks, Luke. I mean, I think it's, it's very difficult to summarise um, that actually the, the range of discussions and I think the, the, the agreement between the, the panellists, I think, I mean, the important thing for me is that cascading risks are difficult. Um, they are complex, 
uh, they're really difficult to quantify. And, and I suppose the important thing is how do we talk to government officials uh, or business um, decision makers who are really used to seeing things in numbers where actually this isn't about numbers. It is, as Daniel said earlier, about reducing the risk massively. We need to, we need to rapidly increase our action on climate change. But then as we start to respond and we see some of these risks and we've already seen some of these cascading risks, um, trying to understand the social systems and then put in place things that are really difficult to measure, um, but are important to act on. And, it, and it's a global acting that, that's needed. I don't know if that was coherent, but that's my thoughts. Both coherent and cogent. Thank you, Howard. We'll move on to Ilona, then we'll go on to Dan. Yeah, thank you. It was really exciting and uh, I yeah, learned a lot and I was inspired also uh, a lot by the discussion. So thank you uh, for the questions. Uh, uh, like something what I, uh, uh, what was the take up home message? I think it's important to recognize the agency that we have, like uh, wherever you are, whether we are a legislator or a policy maker or, or a business manager and, and kind of uh, recognize you know, what's your sphere of influence and what can you do and exactly act now. Uh, this kind of system thinking and global thinking, thinking is necessary and um, um, yeah, thank you for, for this great discussion. And thank you, Eleni, for your contributions. Daniel? Oh, how to summarise such a complex topic is so difficult. Um, I, I think I would refer to the Texas semiconductor chip cascade, uh, want of a better phrase, uh, to, as a way of pointing towards just how unimaginable or how difficult it is to predict cascade. So essentially what happened was the polar vortex weakened a little bit, which allowed more cold air down into Texas. I think probably most people remember there was a really big cold snap uh, in Texas. Um, and that led to or contributed at least to a shutdown of semiconductor chip factories in and around the Texas area. There was already a weak supply of semiconductor chips to the automotive industry and that shutdown contributed to that, uh, which then led to a shutdown or a semi slowdown of the automotive industry. Like, who could have predicted that? Like it's so difficult to, to write a model or, or, or put a risk quantification on that, really, really difficult. Um, and we're just going to see more and more and more and more and more of these instances. Um, and, and, and as I said before, the window of opportunity to avoid them is really, really reducing. So I think all of us need to do what we can as individuals and put as much pressure as we possibly can on our governments to decarbonise as quickly as possible and maybe not worry too much about defining exactly what is going to happen. All we know is it's going to be pretty terrible and it's going to be pretty terrible quite soon. So the sooner we act, the less bad it's going to be. I'm sorry it's a pretty dire message, but that's it. Dire, but still a nice note to end on. Ellen? and doing the, the usual not unmuting. Um, I think the main message that um, we can walk away with it, I mean, there's no such thing as an externality increasingly. And, you know, it's it's depressing to hear from fellow panelists today about things like the 100 billion that, that was supposed to go towards um, uh, vulnerable countries for climate ad adaptation, or indeed thinking about the COVAX commitments that are just aren't reaching um, the levels required. Um, I think we need to shift our thinking on this such that um, that is no longer viewed as um, acceptable because there's no such thing as exempting yourself from um, the risks that we all face um, and we really are all in one one boat um, some are definitely more vulnerable than others but um, this idea that we can exempt ourselves from um, these cascading risks is 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 false and um, and, it, and it's useful for us to think more expansively to to, to realize that Excellent. There are no exemptions or externalities in a globalised world. And for my part, I think a key part thing I took away from all this was that it's not about precisely predicting the future. It's about fragility, resilience, fairness and justice. Great. So I think that's a really good note from everyone to end on.
And I'd like to both thank our panelists for their wonderful contributions. I feel like I've learned an enormous amount in a very, very short period of time, as well as to the organizers of the Climate Risk Summit. That brings us to an end of day one. Thank you, everyone. I hope you've both found this equally enjoyable and stimulating. And we hope to see many of you for day two tomorrow. Bye for now.